Hi, my name is Dave. Today we're going to look at a Polar X-1. Uh, this is a very unusual telescope. Uh, the best hypothesis that I can come up with is that this is a prototype for the very early Nihon Seiko products that were imported both to Europe and uh, to the United States. In Europe they were called Polar X, in the United States they were called Unitron. Uh, so we'll look at this and examine it carefully and, and show you why, uh, I'll show you why I think that and you can come to your own conclusions. Here's a picture of the printing on the focuser. Okay, let's take a walk around this telescope. This is certainly the most unusual mount I've ever seen. It's kind of offset like that. About as bizarre as can be. This is an interesting nut here. Same kind of thing going on down here. The mounting is so much like any kind of standard Unitron you might think of. You might see. Okay, let's compare this telescope with this. This is more or less a generic kind of a inexpensive 60 millimeter refractor. The reason I wanted to show you this is because it's got some similar features. This is balanced as you can see about an axis which goes straight through the tube. Uh, here's a picture to show you what I'm talking about. So uh, with the axis going straight through the tube like that you have good balance in altitude and you can balance it smoothly. This mount features the same thing. I'll show you a close-up of that. And it's the same kind of an idea. The axis goes through here. Now why the builders of this scope elected to offset the axis in that way, I don't know. Uh, but it's pretty clear that they meant for that to be well balanced in both altitude and azimuth so you could move it around easily like this. Uh, of course, this mount doesn't feature any kind of a slow motion control. This one was designed to allow you to also have slow motion. This is a Unitron Model 127. In this size, the Polar X and Unitron numbers were about the same. As they got bigger, for some reason, the number system got different. But uh, this is uh, nominally a similar scope. It's a 40 millimeter, and it's the uh, same focal length. Everything is very, very similar on this scope, but notice the big difference in the mount here. Now, presuming that this telescope evolved into this one, they went to a pillar kind of a system. But the telescope is now mounted up here, and it's not perfectly balanced uh, with regard to the tube, so the axis doesn't go through the tube. Here's a picture to illustrate what I'm talking about. Now why would they do that? Uh, what's the logic? This would seem to be a worse situation than that. However, notice that what they're trying to do here is allow you to have slow motion controls. So they want you to be able to lock it down in altitude, lock it down in azimuth, and then have a fine motion control. This one is really, really strange because if you lock it down, the slow motion doesn't work. It's only when it's unlocked that it works. Let's see, I think you can see that moving. This one has a sort of a different kind of a flaw. It, it gives you the slow motion, but this thing has to be oriented in any particular direction. It doesn't, this doesn't move any other direction except for that other than this.
This one, at least, you can move it around and then use the slow motion. Actually, this is probably a superior system. Um, now, this thing, this thing does give you a nice freedom with uh, regard to that uh, altitude and a good slow motion here. And I'll give you some close-ups so you can compare the the knobs, for example, are virtually identical. A lot of the control system here is virtually identical between these two scopes. Many, many similarities. The finder is different, and then later they went back to a finder more like this, almost identical to this, as a matter of fact, although the finders are almost identical in size. Uh, there are so many similarities that it's, uh, it's kind of remarkable that it would be remarkable if they weren't uh, from the same manufacturer. Okay, let's take a close-up look at these two mounts. This is also a very, very old mount. Uh, and it's clearly Nihon Seiko. Here's the, take a look at the knobs. This is the way the thing works in terms of altitude. And compare that with this one. This one is also very, very old. But I think if you look carefully, you'll see that these things look almost identical. They were almost certainly made in the same factory. Even this philosophy here is quite identical to that. Notice that the, the way those are constructed is nearly identical. These are amazingly different. I don't know exactly <laughs> what's going on with that, but those are quite different. I My hypothesis is that these were handmade and maybe even, uh, maybe even unique to this telescope. These, on the other hand, came straight from a factory. Now check this out too. This is very interesting. This thing is pretty clearly a piece of brass that has been turned. Got a notch in here. That's just to keep it straight. But the this is a simple way to make a, a, a rack. So you've made a rack in a very effective, simple, inexpensive way to do it. Quite different than what's going on here. All right, so uh, presumably this is the evolutionary order of these telescopes. This is uh, the earliest one, uh, at least I think so. This is certainly older than this one. This is a Unitron, and it's uh, 40 millimeter, maybe it's 42. This is 42, this one's 40. I don't know what the deal is there. This has got the very primitive non-rotating azimuth function, and it bolts on here. Um, the finder, it's the strange bolt-on kind of finder. Um, the knobs on this are almost identical. These, uh, I mean, these could almost be, I'm sure they're from the same factory. This one, on the other hand, has quite a few differences. The knobs are bigger. This does have the rotating azimuth, so the whole mount rotates. This is a much more usable knob. This is much more like the, where they eventually settled up in, uh, ended up with the Unitron Altaz mounts. It's got a cradle now also, which allows you to balance the scope. Uh, this thing can't be balanced. It probably is not a big deal, but it, it can't be balanced with a bigger scope. That becomes an issue. Uh, this one, uh, you can take it out of the cradle. And uh, of course you can balance it. And of course they all have the interesting sliding draw tube. And I'm not sure, if, I think Unitron was unique to, in that regard, with uh, with the regard to that style. I could be wrong. Certainly uh, not commonplace. Uh, most other scopes didn't do that. So, uh, and this one has the rotating finder. This rotates so that you can store it away. However, the dimensions of this finder are almost identical. Well, the dimensions of that finder are almost identical also. So, uh, so it looks like the evolution goes from there to there to there.
This is the Polar X1 finder compared with a newer Unitron 60 millimeter finder. And this has got to be maybe the mid 50s. So I think the last ones they made of this, the 40 millimeter scopes were in the 1950s. So um, it all happened very quickly over a few years or so. Let's take a closer look. All right, this is the most recent, if you want to call it 1950s, mid-1950s recent. Uh, what's most interesting about this, I think, is the fact that this whole thing will rotate. The finder is also quite interesting. Fold-down finder for storage. This finder is pretty interesting. It's a fixed finder on a, what I think is an elegant it's kind of a mounting system. I have no idea what possessed them to think that a mount with a fixed azimuth control like this would be a good thing. The altitude is great. Everything is perfect on that. But that azimuth is <laughs> just terrible. And last but not least, here is the what I think is the prototype. I'm just about 100% convinced that's a prototype. I've been trying to think of how somebody could fake this. It would be very very difficult to fake something like this. So I, I think the evidence is pretty clear. I hope you've enjoyed this video on the fascinating Polar X1 telescope. Thank you for watching.